Andy, um, I know you are pioneering this concept of an extended mind, uh, and I want to understand it because I must admit a, an initial predisposition to be an internalist. Uh, mm -hmm. The only things real about consciousness and mind are things in the, that are in the brain and, and internal mm -hmm. to myself. So how can you convince me that things outside are, uh, have a legitimate place in really understanding the mind as opposed to an environment in which the mind operates. Yeah, it's, a, it's going to be a hard sell. It's always a hard sell. <laughs> but I think there are three different ways into this conclusion. Each of them is kind of sufficient on its own. And when you take them together, I think you have a, a pretty strong argument. So the first way in is just philosophical. It's just to raise the question, why should the boundaries of the brain be some sort of magical membrane outside of which um, stuff doesn't count as cognitive, but inside of which it does count as cognitive? Because if you think about the kinds of, the kinds of role that stuff outside the, the head can play, then it seems rapidly clear that if something inside the head was playing that role, then very often we would regard that as part of cognition. So there's a sort of a challenge. Are you just being sort of um, biological shell chauvinist or something <laughs> like that? Um, an example might be, this would only be for going outside the brain, not yet outside the organism. We'll get to that in a minute. But an example might be um, some nice experiments on what happens if you, you, if you give people Botox and ask them to read sentences that are emotion expressing sentences. It turns out that if you, if you make the facial muscles more rigid than they normally are with Botox, then people are slower at reading and understanding sentences mm. um, that express emotional mm. events that mm. would normally have a bodily expression. Interestingly, you can even speed up people's, um, people's reading and comprehension of those sentences by giving them something that increases facial fluidity. I've forgotten what chemical that <laughs> is, but so, so you can push this in both directions. So these loops through what the body is doing are playing some sort of role in enabling us to do stuff, like understand these sentences. So I think there, there are sort of good empirical reasons to think that the loops really matter. Of course, the question that you're raising is, suppose I accept that the loops matter, yeah, right, why right. shouldn't I nonetheless just dig my heels in and say that it's only the bits of the loops that are inside the head mm -hmm. that are doing cognitive work? Mm -hmm. But that's where the philosophical challenge, I think, bites, because the question there is, well, you've got to give me a reason for thinking that. There's got to be a reason for that that is more than your sort of um, basic intuition that somehow minds are what brains do. Okay. So let's go through all three yeah. before I start okay. uh, delving into each. Yeah. Okay, so we could move on to another way of, mm -hmm. of getting at this sort of conclusion, which would be the sort of... Um, sort of socio-technological avenue. So as time goes on, we humans seem to wrap more and more interest in stuff around ourselves. We find ourselves able to do more and more things. If you're, for example, if you're an artist, you might begin to use sketch pads or mm -hmm. complex software programs to layer things one on top of the other. Um, we, under those conditions, we can solve problems, produce works of art that we couldn't otherwise produce. If you then turn around and say, yeah, but all the cognitive work is being done by the bit that's inside the head, then it's not really quite so clear why we shouldn't be able to do this just by doing stuff inside the head. Um, if we encountered a race that was doing this sort of stuff inside the head, we would very easily say of them, oh, you know, they, they've just got slightly different artistic brains mm, to mm, ours. Mm, mm. Um, so that's another route. But uh, the route that I like best, actually, interestingly, is an ethical route. So one of the things that first got me interested in this back in the, back in the 90s, and this is when the, the original paper here was, uh, was first being written with Dave Chalmers, um, co-author of the Extended Mind paper. It was, um, I was working at Washington University in St. Louis. One of my colleagues, Caroline Baum, was an occupational therapist, and she had populations of um, Alzheimer's patients who were living in the inner city and when they filled in the questionnaires and did the tests, there was no way that they should be able to function alone in the environments that they were nonetheless living in. Um, but when, when she went to their houses and looked, their houses were very beautifully structured with kind of post-it notes in the right place, mm -hmm. lots of routines, routines for going out and getting a bus to go and pick up food and come back with the food. 
Um, and so what she ended up thinking was that, the, in a way, these well-functioning patients' minds were kind of distributed across their environments. If you had reached into one of those environments and changed it, or done what was being done a lot in those days, which was taking those people <coughs> out of those environments and yeah. sticking them into care homes, yeah. basically you reduced their cognitive functioning by right. a huge amount. Right. So it was, as Dan Dennett used to say, it was as if someone might have reached into your brain overnight and just lesioned it a bit without <laughs> your permission. So there is this kind of thought that sometimes interfering with what looks like our environment is doing something so profound to us that we should think of it as interfering with ourselves. I could. I might just mention one more example here, which is, um, which is Patrick Jones, a, a Catholic deacon working in Colorado. And he has the kind of um, brain damage that you might be familiar with from films like Memento, Memento uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the movie where a person is kind of using tattoos to remind themselves of things all mm. the time. Um, so he got this injury, it's traumatic brain injury from falling repeatedly off his mountain bike, I think. Um, What's happened is that he's been able to create huge webs of Evernote um, structures and using lots of little bits of off-the-shelf software. And he holds down a job as a working deacon in Colorado Springs. Um, but if you ask him, you know, if, if he was having this interview and, and you left the room and then came back into the room, he'd mm. have to consult his <laughs> iPhone to know what you'd been talking about, what mm. the things were. Mm. But that's mm. what he does. That's mm. how he holds it together. Mm. And I think that to, to not recognize that that's now kind of part of what it is to be Patrick Jones is to do a kind of ethical disservice to, mm. to who and what we humans can be. You, you have something called the parity principle. Uh, yeah. uh, how does that work? Yeah, so the parity principle, if I just state it, it's very easy to misunderstand it, but I will state it. So mm. the parity principle is if, as we look at some cognitive task, something is going on outside the head, such that if it were inside the head, we'd yeah. regard it as cognitive, mm. then until proven otherwise, we should give it the benefit of the doubt and count it as cognitive. Mm -hmm. um, often when people hear that principle, they think that what it means is that the stuff outside the head has to be working like the stuff inside the head, has mm. to operate according to the same principles. So people say, look, your iPhone doesn't work like your brain, your notebook doesn't work like your brain, where's the parity? But it was supposed to be parity of opportunity, not parity of process. It's a functionalism kind of analysis? It's a functionalist kind of yeah. idea. So yeah. um, I think you can have this story without buying any of the versions of functionalism <laughs> that some philosophers find hard to swallow. Right. It's a kind of coarse <laughs> functionalism that, you know, for our intuitive thinking about the mind, what matters is what kind of, what kind of stuff you can do in the world, how fluently you can do it, when mm. you can do it. So when, when I hear all this, I mean, everything makes sense. Uh, but my reaction is that it, it sounds like it is a, a, a very uh, um, a large number of, of, of distinctions, but without a fundamental difference. Um, so know. all of these things make sense, but um, I'm trying to see, is this just a, uh, a, a fine-grained description of the reality that we know, yeah. or does it provide new insights into what the mind and consciousness really is? I can't decide. Consciousness I want to put on one side for now because it's a, it's right, a, right, right, it's right. a very tricky topic and right. I'm not sure that I'm an extended theorist about consciousness though I am about mind. Okay, so, right, that so that's a very good distinction and I agree with that and that, keeps, our, that yeah. keeps us uh, much tighter. So let's yeah. stick with mind, I agree okay. with that. Yeah. And what are the, the predictive insights that we mm -hmm. can get from yeah. extended mind that is counterintuitive or something beyond that which is um, uh, overtly yeah. obvious. Yeah, it's a good challenge. And actually, in the end, you might notice that I don't spend much of my life defending the extended mind story nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of work mostly on the embodied cognition and the predictive brain. Mm -hmm. And that's largely because I came to think that um, cognitive science and maybe the sciences of the mind in general had pretty well bought everything that really mattered mm. about the story. Mm. That's to say they bought the idea that there are these complex interweavings and entanglings between mm -hmm. brain, body, and world, so that if we want to understand how we solve any particular problem or how we can have the kinds of, um, the kinds of minds that we do have, then you have to attend to how all of this stuff works together. 
If at that point someone really wants to dig their heels in and say, I'm going to paint only the stuff that goes on in the brain with the sort of brush of cognition, yeah, and right. all those other entangled bits I'm going to call non-cognition, mm. I got to a point where nothing apart from the ethical argument uh -huh. was moving, was, seemed sufficient. So at that point, I do think that if we, from an explanatory point of view, you very often need to think about the properties of the, the body and the world if you want to understand what the brain's doing because they've been slotted together so neatly. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an explanatory reason for thinking that you want to look at them all. That doesn't mean you have to call them all cognition. Um, the only one that I think really bites for calling them all cognition is the ethical argument that otherwise you might think that damaging Patrick Jones's um, Evernote records uh, is somehow just a crime against his property rather than a crime against the person. Yeah, uh, yeah but uh, I, uh, if I would think that he, it, it, the notes are not part of his cognition, but, he, but what is part of his cognition is the desire to have the notes, um, I, I wouldn't think less of him. Um, that's right, but I think there's a... You, so you wouldn't think less of him, but in the eyes of the law, as it were, um, hurting, stealing, destroying something that someone just desires a lot is rather different to destroying part of them. So, you know, you might, you might be in love with your iPhone and, you know, I would think, oh, okay, that's a really bad thing to destroy that iPhone because, you know, <laughs> it's such a loved object. Right. Um, but that's rather different to thinking that destroying that iPhone is tantamount to destroying part of your cerebral cortices. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, regarding the philosophical difference, uh, if you have the kidney with uh, the urine or the stomach with food, uh, I mean, yeah. all of that occurs within it, yet there are elements outside of it that relate to it. So what's the, yeah. what's the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. fundamental distinction? Um, well, with regard to digestion, of course, one of the things we do do is we cook our food, which I see as a kind of um, external digestion. Right. So one of the things that humans okay. have been really good at is oh. kind of outsourcing digestion right. to, um, to the right. environment. So is that a similar? Um, I think it's a very similar kind of case. Okay, so then, uh, uh, so, so to me that's interesting about mm. digestion, yeah. but it also slightly deflates uh, extended mm. mind is, is, is when the mind extends mm. that that's nothing so super special. Yeah because now we can have it with digestion too. I, I mm -hmm. sort of like that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sort of happy with the idea that there's nothing super special. I never expected the extended <laughs> mind story to be as, um, <laughs> as challenging as it appears to have been. Um, certainly okay. when I talk to quite a lot of cognitive scientists, the notion that cognition might extend is taken to be reasonably unproblematic. Mm. People start to worry when you say the mind extends. And I think that's because mind and consciousness are being kind of tied mm. together. Mm. So it might very well be that a reasonably deflationary understanding of the extended mind claim is, um, is warranted. It might be the right thing to do.